Hello everyone and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 238. This week the questions are taken from guides 284 and 285 on the Shimakaze and Kitakami, and the accompanying Wednesday videos on the Alaska class, and the first video on US Navy fleet problems, which covers fleet problems 1 through 7. Patrick Donnelly asks, Considering their age at the start of World War II, were any of the Imperial Japanese Navy's large cruiser designs considered replacements for the Congo-class battleships dash battle cruisers? Yes, they were. Um, this obviously is World of Warships' interpretation of what the B-65 program would have looked like. They've called it the Azuma, but there you go, it's a nice 3D rendering. Now, the B-65s were intended specifically to replace the Congos in their role as frontline support ships for the cruisers and destroyers that were going in to attack the uh, enemy battle line under the Kantai Kessen Battle Doctrine. And armament-wise, at least initially, they are broadly similar to the Alaskas um, in general purpose. I mean, the details are obviously a bit quite different. They did also look later on, once they got wind of the Alaskas, at regunning them to even larger guns, which would have made them even more definitively battle cruisers. And in some Japanese sources, it also appears that the term Junyo Senkan, which is the basically it's the Japanese term they use for battle cruiser, which they had officially deleted when they reclassified the Congos as battleships during their refits and upgrades, does appear to have made a comeback in official documentation towards the end of the war when they're talking about some of their proposed large dash supercruiser projects. Um, Junior Senkan does survive in informal correspondence and some low-level official correspondence in the 1930s and 1940s, but obviously, as I said, the Japanese have officially redesignated the Congos. Um, but the term, if you like, in, in English, battle cruiser, is coming back. So, yes, both in terms of specific role and in terms of direct replacement, the Japanese were thinking of replacing the Congos before the war broke out. Mohammed Ibrukik, I think, asks, can you say anything about the performance and or potential use of 17-inch and 19-inch guns? There's plenty of data for the 16, 18, and sometimes 20-inch calibers, but I can't find much about guns in the intermediate sizes. Why weren't they considered, and what would their performance be like compared to the 16 and 18 inches? So there was the occasional design study done for the 17 and 19-inch calibers. However, the basic problem that there is with those calibers is that whilst their performance is theoretically going to be approximately middle of the row between the 16 and 18, or the 18 and 20, they are too small an incremental increase. So when you look at the Japanese and US navies, and when you then separately when you look at the German and British navies, there are fairly consistent patterns in terms of gun caliber size increase. And with the British and the Germans, it's broadly about an inch and a half. Now, there is the 11 to 12 inch increase on the Germans that initially go from Nassau to the Helgelands, but otherwise, the British go 12 to 13.5 to 15, and then they're looking at 16.5 and 18. The Germans, similarly, once they go from 11 to 12, go to 13.8 with the Mackensons, and then to 15, so it's not precisely a one and a half, but close enough. Um, and then they are also, for the L20 EA Alphas, looking at 16.5 inch guns. Now what happens after World War I is you get the Washington Treaty coming in, and because the Japanese and the US are building 16-inch armed ships already, that becomes the upper ceiling of the treaty. And the British obviously are building 16-inch G3s after a long fight with their battlecruiser designs initially to try and get them to use 18-inch, and then to try and get them to use 16.5-inch, and eventually surrendering to the fact they have to use 16. And so in the interwar period, you have a slightly artificial increase in calibre from 15 to 16-inch, and as I said, if you go over to the Japanese and the Americans, they go 12, 14, 16, 18, which is clear increments of two. So in neither of those cases 
is the jump ever going to really hit 17? But then why would they look at 17 and 19 at all? Well, you always look at what could we get for a slightly bigger gun, but the reason you have the 1.5 and the 2-inch general increases is that as you increase the size of the gun, you can carry fewer shells for the same size of magazine, you can carry fewer guns for the same size of ships and width of barbette, etc, etc, and you trade that off against a greater explosive power and a greater armour penetration capability with your fewer larger shells. And simply put, if you increase the calibre in most cases by about an inch or half an inch, so 16.5 to 17 or 16 to 17 or 18 to 19, you end up usually having to drop a gun, so a triple becomes a twin, or a twin becomes a single, which you can't have, therefore you need to make the ship bigger and more expensive. But the increase in actual firepower is relatively minimal given the drop in gun barrel count or the increased expense of the ship in question. And when you get up to the really big calibers, possibly also the drop in the rate of fire. Whereas if you go up by one and a half or two inches, you tend to find the broadside weight and increased penetration capabilities of the shells tend to compensate for the loss of number of guns. And so it makes more sense to select them because, well, if you, let's say you're looking at a triple 16 ship and you think, right, well, I can go to twin. Well, if you can go to twin 17 or twin 18, then the twin 18 makes more sense because it's more powerful. And you can't go to triple 17 without making the ship bigger and more expensive. And if you are going to go through the trouble of making the ship bigger and more, and more expensive, you might as well go for a triple 18. And that's it, well, I guess, how you get the Yamatos. Samuel asks, do you think ships like the Alaska and the often maligned SMS Blucher actually represent a better path towards effective cruiser killers than the battle cruisers that we historically got? The main issue seems with battle cruisers that they were often used incorrectly in the line of battle due to their battleship sized guns, whereas ships with an intermediate gun caliber like the Alaska's, the size and crew operating costs seem like a more sensible cruiser killer concept. I wouldn't say either of them is perfect, because compared, at least in concept, to a full cruiser killer, they like the Invincibles versus contemporary armor cruisers, they don't quite tick all the same boxes. But of the two, I'd say the Alaskas are probably closer. Now, the reason I say that is that whilst just having more of the same gun, which is the core of the dreadnought approach it works at a battleship scale because of the fairly devastating impact of a single hit compared to small calibers and the relatively low rate of fire combine that obviously with speed and fire control systems etc etc and you get dreadnought now when it comes to cruisers you face a slightly more difficult thing because with cruisers their rate of fire is going to be greater because they have smaller caliber guns which means that if you are now facing off 2v1 or 3v1 etc there's going to be an awful lot of shells coming at you at which point you are probably going to get hit if the re engagement goes on for a very particularly long time so if you look at the invincibles which realistically are mostly built as cruiser killers their features are speed, they are faster than their contemporary cruisers, so they can choose the distance and chase down their prey. Protection, they have decent enough protection, especially at the longer ranges that they're going to be fighting at against armoured cruisers and protected cruisers, so they're guarded against incoming fire. Okay. Then their guns, they have the firepower because of the larger calibre of weapon, to stay out of the effective range or possibly out of the range completely of various types of armoured and protected cruiser, which further enhances their survivability because, of course, you may not be hit on the armour belt, you may be hit in other softer areas which could cause damage, but if you're fighting at the extreme or range or beyond the extreme range of your opponent's weapons, you're very much less likely to get hit in the first place, which is good. Now, if you look at the Alaska, she's got the firepower element. The 12-inch guns massively outrange and outpower the 8-inch guns she's going to be coming across, most likely, with contemporary heavy cruisers. She's got the armour, 
while she's not the most well protected of vessels in total terms her armor is more than adequate to deal with incoming eight inch fire at the kind of ranges where she could happily sit with her 12 inch guns the only thing she really falls down on is speed uh, in that she's not really any faster than the kind of ship she'd be expecting to be hunting so holding the range and closing and hunting down her target might be somewhat difficult for her now if you can trust that with blucher blucher does have a degree of speed advantage over most armored cruisers of the period but it's not particularly huge uh, as a speed advantage she does of course have a weight of fire advantage but her 8.3 inch guns are about the same as most other they're in the ballpark as most other armored cruisers of course she's using the same guns as the shan horse just more of them british armored cruisers have the 9.2 inch gun which is actually larger the french are using the 7.6 so you know she doesn't have a range advantage over other armored cruisers now she does have a somewhat better armor than most armored cruisers but if she was going to, if Blucher was going to go up against a squadron of armored, cru armored cruisers, she'd definitely need it because she's not going to have the capability, both either in gunpower or really to a certain extent in speed, to be able to hold a range beyond that of the effective range of her targets. And then you have the problem of, you know, if you take on a two or three Minotaur class, for example, you're going to have a lot more 9.2 inch and 7.5 inch shells coming back at you than you're putting out at which point you may be fairly significantly combat degraded relatively quickly. So I would say that Blucher probably better represents the next logical stage in armoured cruiser development, in that she is superior to preceding ships, but I would hesitate to call her an armoured cruiser killer, whereas Alaska definitely is a cruiser killer, with the sole caveat that it, she's going to find it a little bit harder to actually catch things that don't want to be caught as compared to an invincible but the flip side to that that something like an alaska with an intermediate battery is only really possible in world war ii because even the tennessee and pennsylvania armored cruisers with 10 inch guns they're still within shouting distance of say a british 9.2 and if you get much larger than that, you hit 11-inch and 12-inch, which are the lower end of battleship calibers. Whereas, because of the artificial constraints in the interwar period that have limited uh, the heavy cruiser to the 8-inch gun, and battleship gun calibers have gone 14, 16, 18-inch, you know, etc. in the interim, there's now this huge gap where the 12-inch on the Alaskas is actually intermediate as opposed to being you know, lower end battleship assuming we quietly nudge the World War II Shan horse under a carpet somewhere. The Hand of the King asks, Hydrak, I was recently reading about World War II and Korean War carrier operations and strategy concepts, and one of the ideas mentioned was for fleet interceptors using high-speed aircraft with rockets fitted to aid takeoffs and boost climb rates to allow them to get into position to support combat air patrol fighters or engage another enemy attack wave. To me, it seems like an early version of alert aircraft using catapults, so an apparently sound concept. Were rocket-assisted aircraft ever used or tried in this, or did jet aircraft come along too quickly? Whilst the particulars of the Korean War aerial combat are probably best dealt with by someone like Chris from Mil Military Aviation History or Rex's Hangar, um, I'll try and impart what knowledge I do have. So, rocket-assisted takeoff or RATO packs were definitely used in the Korean War, uh, both on land and at sea, by various aircraft. This here is a Sea Fury uh, taking off with the assistance of a Rato pack. Uh, you can just about see a rocket nozzle just under the wing, um, better seen just on the right-hand side of the nearest landing gear. But in any case, from what I understand, the problem was twofold. With the land-based aircraft like the Thunderjet, early jet engines while they offered a high speed they weren't particularly good at low power and they took a while to spool up so especially in hot conditions you could be tooling down the runway for a very long time accelerating very slowly until you eventually get to takeoff speed so the rato packs help with that on carriers of course a rato pack would mean you could take off with a greater than normal load and the other element 
which is the secondary element and perhaps more important for carriers rather than on land, is that aircraft speeds were increasing. And this in some ways mirrored the problems that had been experienced in the 1930s with aircraft back when, at that point, obviously, aircraft spotting was done visually and they would concluded that actually, you know, with the new monoplane aircraft and aircraft cruising speeds increasing to 200 plus knots, there was the concern that even if you spotted the aircraft the minute they crest the horizon, they'd be over your fleet before your fighters could launch and get up into position to intercept. And although you now had radar, you had a similar problem with incoming strikes because now they were theoretically jet powered they might arrive at the edge of your radar detection range and even if you immediately got your own interceptors into the air these new jet powered attackers might be either over the fleet or at least within standoff weapons range of the fleet bearing in mind that standoff weapons were a thing in late world war ii and definitely going into the korean war before your own aircraft could get off of the deck and climb high enough to intercept them because we're still talking about the era of guns not air-to-air missiles so the rato packs as well as helping you get the aircraft off the deck a little bit quicker if by helping you get up into the sky faster i up to altitude it could let you intercept incoming attacks now catapults did already exist in some way shape or form albeit the steam catapult was only really just about being prototyped and introduced around the time of the Korean War. But realistically speaking, the catapult only really solves the problem that the Rato pack used for takeoff solves, whereas using Rato packs, well, technically at that point they're not assisted takeoff, but using some kind of rocket power to help in the climb or the prototype the fighters that were designed that were combined jet and rocket power for interceptors that problem wasn't done away with by the deployment of catapults that was done away with by the power to weight ratio and general performance of jet engines improving so that you could you know send an aircraft out and then it could pitch up put its afterburners on and head up with almost the same performance as a rocket powered interceptor would otherwise have done tina foster asks i was wondering at midway Given that the Japanese are as smart as any other aircraft carrier maintenance people, why did their carriers go up like Roman candles on the 4th of July? It's the standard explanation of lucky hits and lucky airmen, but did the Japanese and the Japanese not having as good strategic damage control, but they seem to have burned with rather too much haste. I must admit this whole question put me in mind of a Star Wars meme I saw a little bit ago, uh, taken from New Hope, where Luke is meeting Obi Wan, and obviously the standard, you know, I, I yes, I knew your father kind of thing. But then the meme goes, "Yes, I met your father at one point. Remarkable man, flammable." Um, <laughs> in any case, going back to uh, the equally flammable Japanese carriers, you've got to remember that in 1942. Um, both the US and Japan did have problems with rather flammable aircraft carriers. The big difference being that with the Americans, their flammable aircraft carrier moment, well, apart from WASP, uh, came with the loss of Lexington. And everybody took a good long look at that from close range and went, right, we need to solve that problem. Um, now, whereas the Japanese lost Shoho in the same engagement battle of the Coral Sea, Shoho was hit by so many bombs and torpedoes that one, her loss was pretty much guaranteed, and two, the fact that she was set on fire was hardly a surprise to anybody. Uh, so they didn't necessarily draw quite the same lessons from that, which then meant that once you got to Midway, well, if the Japanese haven't really drawn significant lessons about just how flammable a modern aircraft carrier actually is, and the Americans have, you get a little bit of a contrast, especially since obviously a lot more Japanese carriers are hit. Um, you then also compound that with the fact that the Japanese had a significant number of fueled and armed aircraft down in the hangars, not on the flight decks, but in the hangars, and any ship that's hit where a bomb explodes in its hangar, where that hangar is full of armed and fueled aircraft is going to have fairly significant fire issues look at bunker hill and franklin for example so where the japanese have kind of if you like a trifecta of misfortune in is that their 
fire control and prevention systems as implemented pre-war, because everyone didn't want their carriers to be on fire, but they were a lot, le a lot less effective than they thought they were, then they didn't have the opportunity to recognize this really from Coral Sea. So they didn't have any uh, ability to make modification. Well, they had the ability, but they didn't have any incentive to make a modification because they didn't know it was a problem. And then they take the kind of hits that actually are pretty much perfect for starting large fires. And, you know, off goes massive amounts of fire in the ship and it's lost. Now, where obviously you look at you know, the loss of Wasp, she didn't really have much in the way of protective systems, period. But then, as I mentioned earlier, you look at Franklin and Bunker Hill, they have the same misfortune of being hit when they're packed full of aircraft and suddenly there's a massive fire going on. But the difference there is that obviously, for the most part, the faults in US damage control and fire prevention systems have already been discovered and rectified, which gives their crew just enough of a fighting chance to get the whole thing back under control. Glauber Glauserger, I think, or Glosserger, asks, at what point does speed usually start to become impractical due to ships never actually going at such speeds or the speeds never making that much of a difference compared with the downsides of building a ship that can attain such speed? As a general rule of thumb, and this is obviously my opinion based on reading statistics, figures, performance, etc. for World War One and World War Two. I would say unless there's some other significant external influencing factor, then a speed margin of about three knots above the average for the ship type is around about the limit of where things will be will stop being practical and start becoming more of a vanity issue. And the reason I say that is that roughly speaking, a three, maybe four knot speed advantage is enough to overcome any issues that might otherwise arise with environmental conditions and mean that you constantly have a speed advantage against your average opponent. So you, at that point you can hold the range, close the range, or open the range at will, and there's precious little your opponent can do. If you have a one or two knot speed advantage, then manoeuvring by your opponent on a more direct course or sea state or wind conditions, etc., might even things out between you three maybe four knots is enough to consistently have some form of advantage and of course if you are in the business of chasing down your opponent it gives you a comfortable enough speed advantage to be able to close your opponent down assuming they start off in visual range within a reasonable amount of time once you start going much past that all you're doing is pretty much that but quicker slightly and you start paying for it with in significant increases in your machinery space requirements and therefore either you end up with a much bigger much more expensive ship or you end up with a ship that has compromised either firepower or protection in the uh, in the sake of further speed which then means that if you do get caught or if you catch your opponent there's a reasonable chance they may actually be able to outlast or outgun you which isn't really a good idea and then once you get up into the truly ridiculous speeds you know ships that can hit 38 40 or more knots then you run into other issues like can you even use your weaponry at those speeds so that's why i've got one of the french super destroyers up yeah the fact that they can hit insane speed is fun but as they very rapidly found out you, they couldn't actually fight at those speeds so it was relatively impractical and you can kind of see from the size of the machinery space as indicated on the side there just how much of a volume and therefore how much of a large and expensive vessel they needed to get up to that kind of speed now, there are, as I said, a few exceptions if you have a significant external factor involved. So the Abdeel class were designed exclusively as fast mine layers. They didn't really have any competition in that field. And so just going absolute extreme speed for the specific role of getting in, laying mines and getting out again makes sense. The Iowas had the external factor compared to the average treaty battleship, which went 28 knots, of needing to keep up with aircraft carriers therefore having 33 knots which is five knot speed advantage over the standard treaty battleship makes a certain amount of sense happily the Latorios and the bismarcks exist uh, 
so actually against some treaty period not necessarily treaty compliant battleships the iowas are still retaining a th their three knot speed advantage roughly speaking assuming that you know they don't go absolute full power so i think i think that would hold true generally across the board whether it's a destroyer a light cruiser a heavy cruiser battle cruiser battleship or a carrier once your speed is more than three or four knots in excess of the average for your type you probably want to just stop it there unless you have a very 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 good third party reason for not doing so zanju asks with the full power of hindsight regarding the performance of all ship types but not the outcomes of any specific battles was it worth it to build any battleships leading up to and during world war ii would a navy that has no battleships but instead increase the number of carriers cruisers destroyers or other ship types do better than a navy with battleships I think you can probably make the argument for two navies. That would be the Japanese and maybe the Germans. The Italians, no, they needed their battleships because even when they were fighting just the Mediterranean fleet rather than what they would have fought if uh, France hadn't dropped out the war, the, Re the Marine Nationale and the Royal Navy... A Italy that has only cruisers and downwards, because they they were still working on carriers at that point, um, that's going to suffer very badly at the hands of the Royal Navy, because the Royal Navy has a fair number of battleships, and the Regia Marina and the Regia Aeronautica, they're not quite as bad as the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy, but they really don't talk to each other very well. So without significant air cover... A cruiser on downforce, even with a few more heavy cruisers, is just going to be you know, adding kill markers to Warspite's bridge. The British need battleships because they need to protect convoys, they need to protect their homeland, they need to protect their fleet, and if anybody else has battleships, again, you know, they can come after them. And whether etc badly hampers carrier operations especially in the perverse part of the war and especially in the north sea and the atlantic so that's not really going to work for them the americans need battleships partly again because the other side in primarily for them the Cong the congos as a attack force against their carriers is a significant problem they do need a, a heavy ship defense a lot of it does come down to the other side has battleships therefore we need our own because otherwise the other side's battleships or battle cruisers can do significant damage as i said the the japanese you could probably make a relatively decent case because the only battleships they built in the run-up to and during world war ii were the yamatos and because they were a little bit reluctant to use them, the Yamato and Musashi didn't actually do much during the war. Uh, as I've mentioned before, if they'd used Yamato or Musashi, probably Yamato, at, in the Guadalcanal campaign, okay, that could have been uh, fine. But Yamato's primary activities consisted of sailing in support of formations that never actually engaged in combat, then... And they're, they're only the Yamato and Musashi's only real combat debuts, if you like, were the, towards the end of the war, uh, Sibuyan Sea and Samar, which of course resulted in Musashi getting sunk. And Yamato managed to chase a bunch of escort carriers. Well, Congo, Haruna, and Nagato were perfectly capable of doing that. And then Tengo, where it provided target practice for US carrier formations. So if those resources had been put into building more destroyers more cruisers more carriers more whatever because then those ships probably would actually have been used in the front line a bit more you could argue that the japanese could have had a significantly better war without the yamatos and with a Yam two yamatos worth of resources plus i guess shanano just into anything else with the germans it's a little bit marginal because the Scharnhorsts and the Bismarcks, they do tie down significant allied resources, 
you know, having forcing them to have battleships and carriers escorting the Arctic convoys, old battleships on the Atlantic convoys, etc. So it limits the capability of the Allied fleets because they're having to put a lot into worrying about what happens if um, the Scharnhorst or Bismarcks get out. But in terms of overall utility, well, you know, apart from just tying down resources, Tirpitz doesn't really do much get except get bombed. Bismarck manages to sink Hood and then get sunk herself. Gneisenau sinks some merchant ships and along with Scharnhorst obviously finishes off Glorious, etc. Um, then some, you know, Jervis Bay, Raoul Pindy, that kind of thing, but then gets bombed and torpedoed. Scharnhorst obviously gets sunk by Duke of York. So I, th I think with the Germans they probably needed something capital ship grade to worry the allies with but if you want to split the difference i guess at that point if the germans had had just the Scharnhorsts, manifestly apart from the loss of hood it probably would have had just as much effect to have the Scharnhorsts and no bismarcks as having the Scharnhorst and the bismarcks and if you had again bismarck resources and devoted to something else that might have been somewhat useful. GTH042 asks, at what point in your career did you realise this hobby is getting out of hand and you have to make some serious life balance choices? Was it dry dock number three, day two of jet lag after coming back from the States, or something else? I think it was some point around about the beginning of 2021. Um, so, I mean, we spent most of the previous year in lockdown, and at the time I was still working for Croydon Council, and of course I was working during the day, working from home, and I obviously pre prior to that I'd worked for TFL, I'd worked for Croydon Council, while I was also running the channel in, in my spare time, and during the first part of lockdown I had thought oh, okay i can use my what had been my commuting time to run the channel as well as my spare time so that i thought that might give me some spare time back um, but as it turned out you know things that the channel could do expanded and i ended up actually you know doing just more with the time i had available and then as for those of you who are in the uk who might not remember this uh, croydon council went bankrupt bankrupt for the first time <laughs> i think they've gone bankrupt like two or three times since then as well but uh yeah the council went bankrupt so everything was up in the air um jobs wise um administration wise i've talked about all of this kind of before um and this had been an ongoing issue for some time but I was beginning to get a little bit disaffected, not with the work I was doing. I still enjoyed the work I was doing and the team I was working with in the council. But some of the ways that some of the higher up echelon stuff was being managed really didn't sit particularly well with me, especially right at the very top. And as I said before, I talked about like administrative interference and so forth. Well, the minute as you know, the, the nail that stands proud gets hammered down, the minute you start to become successful, other suddenly everybody wants a piece of that work so they can vicariously claim credit. Anyway, going into the start of 2021, I was sitting there and thinking, well, I'm actually probably putting in two-thirds about of the hours that I put into my regular day job into the channel but the difference is that even though that means I'm working what probably 11 12 hour days I'm enjoying do working on the channel for the most part and because of the aforementioned reasons I'm not enjoying large portions of what I'm doing at the council and since the income levels of the two had roughly reached parity on average, whilst having two incomes was nice, I really wanted to cut down on the amount of work I was doing. And so I had to make a choice. Do I continue with my engineering career um, at the expense of the channel? Or do I move full time over to doing the channel instead of continuing with engineering? And ultimately, I was enjoying the channel more, as I said, 
Um, but I also saw the channel as another thing, which was an ability to escape from executive interference generally. And I, I've worked for a variety of different companies over time, um, private companies and public local authorities, Richmond Council, TfL, um, London Borough of Croydon, as I said, um, and as I say, various private entities. And I was continu continuously throughout my career had come across, as I say, this executive level interference where you can do your job, you can potentially do your job well, but the minute you start doing any element of your job in a way that your superiors either don't like because it's not exactly how they personally would do it, regardless of whether the results are actually the same or better, or if you are doing something in a way that makes them look bad in some way, shape or form, then all of a sudden, instead of embracing the fact that you are working in a superior way and this should be something that should be celebrated and encouraged, they start trying to undermine and sabotage you in order to, I guess, allow them to continue working without having to worry about these kinds of things. And the slightly odd thing I found is that in most of my various engineering jobs, it's not usually your immediate manager that's the problem. One or two jobs it was. But the majority, it wasn't your immediate manager or even your manager's manager that was the problem. It was usually, you know, three plus ranks up the line that was the problem. And unfortunately, they're also the ones who tend to have the most power in terms of whether or not you continue in your job or not. And so I kind of decided, well, I'm, I've, I'm done. I, I don't want to work for people like that anymore. And given that I, as I've worked for three different local authorities and in engineering terms, three different private companies as well, I was beginning to see a pattern. It wasn't just an isolated, pe you know, one bad manager here or there or a problem with a private industry or a problem with the public sector because I'd worked in both. It just seems to be a general problem with higher level management and upper middle management generally. Whether that's true in other industries apart from engineering, I don't know, but it certainly was my experience at which point I thought well you know if I work for myself then if I need to have a very very stringent conversation with myself about my work ethic then I will have that and I, I will consult very deeply with myself on my performance and tell myself that I will do better otherwise I will be very disappointed with myself and then I'll probably develop complete multiple personality disorder and go mad um, if I haven't done so already. Warren Lemkula II asks, Despite the fact that we have the capacity to make accurate blueprints to follow, people still made large mock-ups of planned warships. What were they used for, and what happened to them when the Navy was through with them? Were they ever taken to the Pentagon's sub-sub-basement and used in the largest tabletop war game ever, or just thrown away? It depends on the kind of model in question. These days, they can do all sorts of fancy things like radar cross-section profile testing and so forth. But back in the day that the channel covers, uh, the more rough mock-ups could be used for things like checking profiles, checking arcs of fire, um, checking silhouettes at different angles. Because, of course, you can draw a blueprint, but especially in those days when your drawing is essentially 2D, you can, 3D modelling on computer doesn't really exist. If you want to see what a ship looks like from various angles, building a mock-up is probably the best way of doing it. And also wind tunnel tests are very important. Carriers obviously very important, but also for ships generally, you know, is this ship going to drift sideways more in a stiff breeze than its predecessor? How is the superstructure going to affect a ship's handling? And not just wind tunnel testing but also hydrodynamic testing you know is this whole form going to be efficient or is it going to cause a huge amount of drag all of these things back in the day you needed a physical model to test these days you can do a lot of those tests with a three-dimensional computer model but if in the absence of computers and significant processing power a wooden mock-up is the best way to go plus when you get into more detailed plans or more detailed models like you can see here this also allows you both to show off the ship um you know show off how how it's made and show off to people what their new ship is going to look like before it's completed in a way that is far superior to 
just unrolling some blueprints, but it also allows quick and easy visual checks. So if you are, let's say, in an overseer's office in the dockyard, and you have a detailed builder's model like this, uh, this is the World War One HMS Gurkha, I believe. If you have that in your office, and you happen to look out of your window, and you see somebody building this ship or a classmate of it, and you see, let's say, that the um, anchor chains are entering the hull, someone's running them through the first scuttle there, or the first porthole, you immediately know they've done something wrong, and you can go, right, stop it. And again, it's much easier for the human eye to visualize a builder's model like this, as opposed to having to, you know, break out one of about 50 large sheets of paper and go, oh, hang on, this is this and this. But from this angle, it might look like this. And um, OK, but that's details not on the here, but maybe I'm looking at the wrong drawing, etc. Whereas a model is just like, well, that doesn't look like that. So something's clearly wrong somewhere. Now, as for what happens when the Navy is through with them, it greatly depends on, well, the Navy in general, but also on who has made the model. Um, rough, very rough wooden mock-ups used for tank testing or wind tunnel testing would usually end up decaying or being chucked out eventually. The more detailed ones like this, again, if it's been made by a private builder, let's say the uh, shipyard, commercial shipyard has designed the ship, They'll probably keep it in their archive somewhere, or they might dispose of or sell it. The military ones, the finer detail stuff, again, probably goes into storage for a while, and then maybe will be donated or transferred over to a museum of some description, or might well still be in storage in many cases. Some of the larger ones might end up getting broken at some point or being chucked out, but those will tend to again to be the sort of hydrodynamic or aerodynamic test models the very very detailed builders models they usually end up in some kind of collector's hands whether that's a museum privately or if the navy in question has some kind of museum of their own or dedicated storage zone airplane master one asks other possible refits or modernizations for the japanese navy's legacy light cruisers the sendai's nagara's kumas tenryu's and maybe the chikamas were all undoubtedly second-line combatants by World War II, um, but almost all of them are capable of above 30 knots, so they'd make a solid, fast, heavyweight escort or patrol ship. So how would you turn them into maybe anti-aircraft cruisers akin to the Royal Navy's C-Class? Uh, strip out all the 5.5-inch guns for dual-purpose 5-inch that they used as secondaries in capital ships and primaries on their destroyers, or maybe the 100 mils that were found on the Akazukis, and of course adding 25 millimeters for dubious purposes. I think an anti-aircraft cruiser conversion certainly could be on the cards for them. However, I would hesitate at a direct one-to-one -one because the twin 100mm, which would be my definite choice, I would not take the uh, the twin 5s, apart from anything else. A twin, the twin 5-inch mount is massively heavier than the single 5.5s that they've got, but um, also... Japanese Twin 5 is not a good anti-aircraft gun. The Twin 100 is much, much better. And the, although it still weighs more than a single 5.5 mount, it weigh, the weight difference is considerably less. So if you take the general case of these cruisers, because obviously some of the smaller ones are slightly less well-armed, but if you take the general case where you have two, or th two, three guns on the back, a couple of guns forward, a couple of guns on the wings, and torpedo launchers on the sides as well, I would look at taking, remove the aircraft catapult aft, that'll save some weight in space, probably reduce them down to just a couple of twin torpedo launchers, one each side, or for the earlier ones where they're on the center line, a single twin launcher on the center line. Again, that'll save weight in space, and take off the wing mounted guns where applicable. Now, that should leave you with something like, say, a Sendai class, as you can see here, with two gun mounts forward, three gun mounts aft, all on the center line, and a considerable amount of saved weight. With the removal of also the aircraft um, handling facilities and catapult, I think you could probably get, uh, especially if you delete the aft torpedo launchers on a Sendai, you could probably get four twin 100mm mounts aft, and then two forward. 
uh, whether you want to put them side by side or one after the other, as was historically done with the main armament. Uh, it's kind of up to you. But then that gives you six twin 100mm guns or a 12-gun battery, which, I mean, they're small enough. That would actually make them quite lethal cruiser, uh, sorry, destroyer flotilla leaders if you wanted to use them in that role, but would also give you a pretty good anti-aircraft battery. If you then want to stick 25 mil on to give the rest of the crew something to do in an air attack, you can put them down either side of the machinery spaces. But if you really want to push the boat out and spend a bit more money, you could also perhaps look at modernizing the machinery and standardizing the speed, because some of them were relatively quick. But if you reduced the machinery by modernizing it and said, right, we're now going to go at, th at a standard speed of 33 knots, you could probably then free up additional space amidships, which you might be able to get another twin 100 mil in. So you might have at that point seven uh, 100 mil mount, twin 100 mil mounts total for a total of 14 guns that can range on either broadside. Or you might be able to fit something else in there uh, amidships, maybe probably extra quarters for all the additional gun crew or something like that. And that, that might be a reasonable way of going about modernising them to anti-aircraft cruiser spec. Blackburn and Blackburn Maximum asks, how many Blackburn Blackburns could a Blackburn Blackburn burn if a Blackburn Blackburn could? And then it stops. Anyway, they ask, say a World War I coastal gun was positioned on the edge of a cliff and aimed down by 80 degrees. Would there be any, any worry of the shell sliding down the barrel before it fires? either in a fixed or non-fixed cartridge or bag charge? And if so, would this issue scale with size, such as a 4-inch shell going up to a 12-inch or even an 18-inch shell? Theoretically, no, thanks to the rifling, assuming that this is a rifled gun and not a smoothbore gun. I mean, if it is a smoothbore gun, then you would have some serious issues. But, assuming we're talking 20th century rifled guns, the driving bands being engaged by loading it. I don't think you're going to be loading the thing at negative 80. That would certainly be impressive to see. But assuming that you could actually, you know, load it and engage the, the driving bands, I don't think it, you should have too many problems. You might have a little bit of an issue if you're not careful with the weight of the charges potentially pushing the shell very slightly down the rifling, which could be a problem, especially for larger guns. But broadly speaking, it's not the shell that you really need to worry about. It's going to be more what's happening with the propellant. <laughs> um, yeah. And also, well, you know, recoil and everything. Alternate historian Turtle Duck asks, how do shipborne aircraft catapults work? Was steam power, electrical power, hydraulic power, or spring tension used to launch aircraft? And did this change over time, or did, was it dependent on the size of ship? Well, spring-loaded flywheel and compressed air power catapults were used quite liberally in early experiments and in the civilian world. But when you narrow down to the widespread use of aircraft catapults, mostly in the interwar period, both aboard regular ships like this, and on aircraft carriers, it generally speaking comes down to one of two. Um, hydraulic catapults where you have longer runs, so aircraft carriers, for example, if they have them, and where you have shorter runs, generally it was gunpowder. And yeah, so you're basically shooting the plane off in a matter of speaking. So battleship, cruiser catapults, etc., they would very often be gunpowder-charged catapults. You've got, in theory, the catapult arm merchantmen theoretically using rockets, but I'm always slightly leery as to the, the dividing line on that, whether it's the catapult that's got the rocket or the aircraft. Um, most of the pictures seem to indicate it's the catapult sled that has the rocket, but there are a few images of aircraft using what I guess would be early Rato packs to take off. And then, of course, towards the end of the time period that the channel covers, you would have st the steam catapult being developed. 
Now, that's not necessarily to say that all capital ships and cruisers used some kind of powered catapult. Very rarely you would have some other form of system. So a few ships experimented with the idea of not having catapults at all. They would just crane their ships. Sorry, they would crane from the ships the aircraft over the side and it would take off, off on the water. And some very early forms of aircraft mounted on ships, especially when you're mounted on top of a turret, would sometimes just launch using a little bit of a downward slope and people or brakes holding them back until they'd wound up to full power but that was a very transient phase when aircraft were really really light and could do that kind of thing. Sebastian asks the US used the talk between ship system as a form of ship to ship communication similar to the telephone. I've read ships that didn't have it installed yet like Marblehead in 1942 were a real disadvantage since it still needed to communicate with other ships using signal lights or flags. Did other nations have a similar system? Yes, various navies experimented with voice radio, if you like, at various times during their respective development cycles and histories. Some voice radios were actually in service, believe it or not, in World War I and were used to try and coordinate things between convoys, as in within the convoy, between the various ships within it. There were a few issues to overcome. Admiral Cunningham recounts that in the very early 1920s, the Royal Navy destroyer flotillas actually had quite a widespread voice radio communication system. But as I've covered in the uh, biography of Admiral Cunningham Part 2, this was removed from the ships because pencil pushers back at the Admiralty decided they didn't like the fact that they couldn't easily record and transcribe everything that was said over the voice radios which was a bit stupid, um, and it took a while to get that capability back. But one of the other challenges facing people who wanted to use voice radio was, of course, the fact it was very easy for people to overhear, because making a voice radio was one thing, making a voice radio that could be encrypted and decrypted in real time was quite another. Uh, one of the solutions that they came up with for that was actually to increase the frequency of the radio transmissions, which shorten the range, which ordinarily would be a bad thing, but if the idea is to use the voice radio to only communicate with people within visual distance, then by raising it to ultra high frequency bands, you would end up with a signal that would attenuate effectively by the time it reached the horizon, if not sooner, which meant that anyone who was waiting over the horizon wouldn't be able to hear what you were saying, which was a good idea. but. Because various navies went back and forth with the idea of having it at all and then how to implement it in the interwar period, once you got to World War II, despite the fact that, theoretically speaking, the technology was already over two decades old, implementation within various navies was actually quite patchy, surprisingly, even at that late time period. Excelsior 1 asks... Once the keel is laid, what's next? For context, let's say we're building a North Carolina class battleship. Is it strakes and then hull plate? When do the bulkheads go in? When does the internal armor belt get added? Does hull plate count with it with that thickness? Or because it's different types of steel, is it really irrelevant? I know most shipbuilding is modular now, but were certain things pre-built like the superstructure, which would then theoretically be lifted in? Well, you're in luck. Here is USS Washington, one of the North Carolina class, shortly after keel laying. So, as you can see, whereas on an age of sail vessel, once the keel is laid, you would be putting in the major framework, you can see with the North Carolina class battleship, what's actually happening is the keel's going down, and then the outer shell plating for the underside of the hull, which forms the double and then the triple bottom, goes in with some basic framing attached to the keel, obviously, to support it. But you can already see that some of the bulkheads are going up with their framing, as well as other longitudinal beams, etc., pretty early on in the ship's construction. And then as the build progresses, you'll notice that even once the build has quite substantially progressed, you can see now the barbettes are going up and so forth, and you, there's some fairly major frames going up on either side as well the bow is still effectively non-existent and um, the main deck in the center is actually pretty much entirely there uh, they've built up to that level so 
and then you've got obviously the bulkheads coming in, more bulkheads going in fore and aft of the barbettes. So when the belt armor is added, the hull plating doesn't count. Internal belt armor, actually, you'd be surprised. Sometimes there'll be areas where, if you like, hull plating in and of itself may not exist. That's relatively rare, though, and in very, very minor patches. Usually you will have hull plating and a form of... Um, padding if you like some kind of wood so if you look at pictures of hms tiger for example being completed you'll see there's a thick layer of teak behind um, and so on and so forth but the whole plating thickness will not be counted towards the thickness of the armor belt itself uh, basically it's it's so thin as to be functionally irrelevant once you've factored in the lamination reduction factors as far as the superstructure the entire superstructure, no, in those days would not usually be modular and just dropped in. It would be constructed in situ. But as time went on, elements of the upper works could be dropped in wholesale. Um, turrets, for example, at least on the smaller ships. Yakuzka Girls Marine High School training vessel Harakaze asks, what is the oldest ship in commission that can still sail under its own power and engage in combat, so not including ceremonial vessels such as Victory and Constitution, and can you tell us some of its history? Honestly, I don't actually know. In I suspect it's going to be something that's actually still in service with navies, because although there's a lot of 19th century civilian vessels going around, all the 19th century warships generally seem to, in one way, shape or form, be per permanently immobilised and need toes to get around. Um, so, I mean, Kamuna maybe, albeit that she's a salvage ship, so the only combat she can really engage in is machine gun fire, which would then probably make it something like the Brazilian monitor Parnaiba, which I've done a video on. Um, if I had to put any money on a vessel that could potentially, you know, within reason be made active and theoretically go out and fight something to whatever effect, my money would be on the ironclad Huascar purely because she had her engines completely rebuilt, relatively speaking, recently within the last 50 years. So unlike most 19th century warships, she might actually be able to get her engines going at which point well she's already afloat and with the engines going moving on her own, under her own power that's two-thirds of the battle then it would just be a case of whether or not the guns still work uh, but we don't know so for right now my safe bet money would be on the Parnaiba which is a product of the 1930s and I say for its history I'll reference you back to the video I did on it but it'd be interesting to see if some of the others could get going there was a plan last decade to see if Georges Avarov, the Greek armoured cruiser, could get her engines rebuilt and sail under her own power, which would put her top of the list. But I don't believe that's actually been done as of yet. And finally, question-wise, Jay Mace asks, Once a long time ago, I read that the crew of Bismarck managed to repair the right rudder during its final night before the British battleships arrived. While at first glance it seems far-fetched to impossible in its final battle, Bismarck did make several right-hand turns, starboard turns, even though it wasn't supposed to be able to after its damage. I understand that with the left rudder jammed it would be a wider turn, and that with both rudders turned 12 degrees in opposite directions, the ship would be slower. But surely if the rudder was repaired, they would have been able to correct the ship's course. Unless one rudder jammed over at 12 degrees is something they can't overcome? Yeah, I don't think that happened. Um, <laughs> Bismarck's port side rudder is completely gone. Her starboard rudder is mangled. And although you can't be 100% definitive about these things, it does seem that... It's the starboard rudder that got mangled by the torpedo and was probably more proximate to the torpedo, but it was effectively, if you like, end-on to the torpedo explosion, whereas the port side rudder seems to have absorbed it kind of sideways on and then snapped off. So one rudder's dead, the other rudder's probably gone when that 
impact occurs. So given that we know that they never repaired the uh, the right hand rudder, uh, yeah, that the area around in the area within the ship, the steering compartment was flooded, water was coming in and out. Um, there's there's no credible way in which it could be argued that Bismarck's crew fixed one or other or both of the rudders before the battle. Um, she was seen to be wallowing and meandering somewhat during the battle and continued to do so right up until she came to a stop and sank. So, yeah, I mean, the fact that she made right turns doesn't really mean all that much, to be honest, because if, as the evidence seems to suggest, she only had one rudder and that was jammed at somewhere between 12 and 15 degrees, given her size and given the sea state, it would be entirely possible for wind and or currents to push her around in a direction contrary to the rudder, especially when she's traveling slowly, which she was towards the end. Because there wouldn't be, if you know, if she's moving along at eight, ten knots, there's not going to be that much force actuating over the single rudder compared to a very high sea or something like that. And that brings us to the conclusion of this dry dock with one uh, little addition to make. So, in the Patreon dry dock a couple of weeks back, I mentioned when someone asked about how armor plate was supported, was it joined together, etc., and I said that you know basically it's a set it's a set of close fitting plates but without any particular join to each other after the experiments initially with warrior showed that that wasn't such a brilliant idea now um I do hold by that for the most part but as uh, Nathan Oaken who many of you will probably know um who does comment occasionally in various dry docks and so forth uh, he actually came in and pointed out that in by World War II, there was some joining together of the armor plates, and that took place by means of creating um, wedge-shaped cuts in the back of the plate, the softer part, uh, the not, not the face-hardened part, and then putting in these kind of wedge-keyed units to lock the armor plates together. Uh, that's actually, ironically enough, very similar to... Uh, n in principle if not in the exact shape to stuff that's done in both woodwork and also in of all things inca stonework but there you go um and the parthenon as well i think you know great minds think alike when it comes to joining together large heavy objects so there you go you know for the for the most part ironclad era pre-dreadnought era and i would say probably the bulk of the dreadnought era what i said in the previous answer about the fact that arm plates just bolted to the the ship structure would hold true but it's not exclusively true when it comes to the latter part as uh, mr oaken was kind enough to point out so thank you for pointing that out and hello um <laughs> glad you're watching and uh see everyone again in another video soon